And then of course, retirement, this is the one. What's interesting to me about retirement is this is the one incentive that everybody worldwide says, this is a good thing. Nobody's complaining about the rich getting too much tax benefit from pension plans, right? Right. And yet this is the only one of the seven where the government just breaks even. They, they don't make money on it. They're the, it's the only one where the government does make money. Uh, they're not losing money. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just going, you know, it's so ironic to me that the government has, you know, there's these seven segments of the economy. The government is really incentivizing heavily that the government does really well in six of them. Yeah. And the one they don't do well in is the one that the, that the, that the uh, very um, the vast majority of the population would say that one's okay. The others, uh, I'm not so sure. They, they, <laughs> I don't know about those. You know, right. I, I think those are just good lobbyists, right? Yeah, no, right. I mean, that's, it doesn't work that way. It's, it's, it's Welcome to AFO Wealth Management Forward, a podcast about finance, accounting, technology, and entrepreneurship. We apply our decades worth of experience and insight into what makes businesses work so we can help others grow both personally and professionally. In this ever-evolving marketplace, we help accounting firms and financial advisors grow their practice through the adoption of holistic wealth management services. Learn from industry leaders and subject matter experts to unlock the secrets of their success. A podcast that shows people and companies the transformative power of technology so they don't fear it, but instead harness it. Don't fight the robots, team up with them. And here are your hosts, Rory Henry, Director of Business Development and CEO Rob Santos of Arrowroot Family Office. All righty. Hello, everyone. Today, I am joined again by Dan Casey of Arrowroot Family Office. Dan, how are you doing today? Doing great. Doing great. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Before we get into our esteemed guests, uh, I just want to talk about briefly, UCLA and SC are going to the Big Ten. So I could be visiting <laughs> you in Michigan here in 2024 and beyond. Did, did you see that news? I think this is a great pipeline for some for some business travel. Yes. And, uh, you know, UCLA versus Michigan State, I'm sure that tailgate will be uh, a tons of fun. And Ann Arbor is about 45 minutes from us at the offices here in Michigan. And State is probably in a uh, little over an hour. So it's not... Not a bad commute uh, no. to, to get over there. Yeah. You show me the Midwest tailgate. I'm going to show you the Rose Bowl UCLA Henry tailgate that we do. Love it. Legendary. So we'll do a tailgate uh, experience. <laughs> All right. Let me, let me get our guests on here. Uh, we're excited to have him. He is a CPA and the CEO of WealthAbility, a platform that helps entrepreneurs and investors reduce their taxes and create wealth. He is a best-selling <laughs> author with books like Tax-Free uh, Wealth. And he just released a book called Win Win Wealth Strategy Seven Investments the Government Will Pay You to Make. So, without further ado, let me introduce our guest, Tom. We all right, Tom. Welcome to the show. Nice to be with you guys. Thanks very much for having me. All right. Let's get started here. I always like to talk about origin stories with our guests. Can you provide our audience you know, with a background here, how you became to start with Ability and, and, and release these books? Yeah. So, I, I actually grew up in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. So um, wow. when I was a young man, I spent two years learning how to get rejected in French in uh, <laughs> Paris. So <laughs> I, uh, I started really early in my career learning that uh, rejection is not the, not, not the worst thing in the world. Entrepreneurship is one of the best things in the world. And uh, spent seven years with Ernst & Young, uh, one of the big four CPA firms, three years in their national office, spent four years with a Fortune 1000 company. Um, in the, uh, as their in-house tax advisor and, uh, and then uh, decided to start my own business. And I started my own CPA firm from scratch. Uh, pretty quickly learned that it's cheaper to buy one than to start one from scratch. And <laughs> Buy not build, right? <laughs> buy not build, that's right. And I bought a few of them over the years, sold a few of them over the years, uh, sold my last CPA firm about four years ago. And we decided to build instead a network of CPA firms, and so we have a network of about 60 CPA firms around the U.S. and in Canada, and uh, we uh, work solely with entrepreneurs and investors. And really, the idea is to really help them help the entrepreneurs and investors make way more money, pay way less tax. So yeah. those two things tend to go together. Yeah. Um, let's dive in here. I know you've talked about, uh, you know, you probably ask yourself, what's Tally for? Well, Tally for is a tax flow that empowers firms to automate the tax trial balance 
saving them hours per return in three easy steps. Import, adjust, and file. Import. Talent4 accepts data from all major accounting systems. Adjust. Your accounting and tax teams can collaborate to make all the necessary tax-based adjustments. And file. Once the tax trial balance is completed and approved, Tally4 can send it to any leading tax product. Tally4's import, adjust, and file process will help you reduce the time it takes to create a tax return from hours to just minutes. To learn more about using Tally4 for your CPA firm, head over to tally4.com. That's T-A-L-L-Y-F-O-R.com. Why does Warren Buffett's uh, secretary pay more in taxes uh, than he does? Can you kind of talk about that? And this, the model, I, I, I wish... We had a visual here with your quadrant, your four quadrants uh, of employee, self-employed, uh, big business owner, and the professional investor. Can you kind of dive into, into that concept? Well, yeah, kind of. The, the concept is, is uh, first of all, remember that the tax law, it's about 6,000 pages. Yeah. And there's one line that says all income's taxable unless we say it isn't. And another line that says <laughs> nothing's deductible unless we say it is. And then there's a few charts and tables, tells you how much tax to pay. But most of it is really a, a guide or a roadmap to tell you, okay, here's how you pay fewer taxes and who, who's, here's who pays the most taxes, who pays the least taxes. And um, what, what we've learned over the years is that <laughs> the, uh, it's not the employees that pay the most. They do pay a lot. Um, it's actually self-employed people who tend to pay the most. Uh, an employed person anywhere in the world is going to pay about 40% in tax if they make a good income. Self-employed person is going to pay upward of 60% because they're paying the employer share and the employee share. Uh, big business owners only pay about 20% uh, around the world. That's typically true around the world. And professional investors can pay as little as zero. That's where tax-free wealth comes from. So, um, you know, if you look at Warren Buffett, Warren Buffett's big business owner, right? Mm -hmm. And a professional investor. So he's going to play somewhere between zero and 20%. And his secretary is, an, I'm sure, a highly paid employee. So she's going to pay 40%. So it's, it's, it's really just how you make your money has a big impact on how much tax you pay. Sure. Yeah. And let's dive into the book now, uh, Tom. You have the, the seven... Uh, uh, different investments that the government will pay you to make. You know, can you go over those seven? I don't. I don't want to give away the whole book, but can we provide an overview of those seven? Investments? Yeah. Well, so so here, let, let let's first of all start with the premise that um, we're all partners with the government, yeah. whether we like it or not. <laughs> we are all partners with the government. The first time you get that paycheck and you look at that pay stub yeah. and you say, "Who the heck is FICA?" Um, you know, you're a partner with the government, right? And so, um, you know, the, the question is, though, you, what most people don't know is most people think they're silent partners, and that's their only choice, unless they cheat on their taxes, right? Um, what most people don't realize is that you can choose to be an active partner. So you can either be a silent partner, which is typically, which is most people, or you can be an active partner, which is all that those big business owners and the professional investors, they're very active partners with the government. In other words, what is it? that the government wants done and what incentives have they provided um, in order to get those things, uh, get people to put their money there, put, get people to put their efforts there. So of course the big one, which is the obvious one is business. Mm -hmm. Because uh, if, if you think about the last couple of years, everybody, <laughs> everybody in earth has been working from home, yeah. right? Seriously, everybody on earth has been working from home uh, for the last couple of years. If you were an employee and working from home, you got no tax benefit. But if you were owned your business, you got to deduct your office working from home. So that should be an obvious clue that, <laughs> wow, the government favors business owners. Mm -hmm. And, and the, right. the reality is, so I actually, I did some interesting, well, they're interesting to me. I'm an accountant. Um, <laughs> but I, I did some interesting um, uh uh, examples in this book about, okay, so how much does the government really pay? Will the government really pay you to start a business? And the answer is actually, to me, it was surprising. And this, yes, the actual, the government, the, the tax benefits from starting a business are greater than the cost of starting the business. Wow. That's staggering. It, 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 it literally is really, I, I mean, it was eye-opening to me because I'm going, oh, I know, you know, we're going to get some, some help here from the government, right? No, no, sure. the, go the government literally will pay you to start a business. They'll so, literally pay you to start it. So, Tom, does that correlate to 
they feel like the incentive incentivization uh, for job creation offsets any you know taxation or investment that they might see. Well, it's it's two it's two sides of that. There's actually two pieces of that. And thank okay. you for bringing that up. Uh, one is yes, absolutely. They, they want job creation. They want new technology. They want you know they want the economy to grow. All that kind of stuff. But the government actually makes money at this. <laughs> if you if you were to look at this, so I actually ran the numbers for both the government and the taxpayer in every single one of these seven investments, and in every one but one, the government wins more than the taxpayer wins. Financially, wins more than the taxpayer wins. So if you think about this, okay, so let's say the government puts down um, $10,000 to help you start your business, right? Well, guess what? You are you have that partner with you forever. So you start making money, you're going to start paying the government back. They're going to get taxes from that. You start hiring employees, the employees are going to start paying taxes back. Right. So the the government actually is in a position any investor would kill to be in the position of the government okay because you're basically the house right yeah. so you 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 make the rules right you you own the game you make the yeah. rules you ju- you you enforce the rules you judge the rules and you can change the rules at any time and you're you're and on top of that you're in the game <laughs> you have a customer for life and then after they die. So it's a pretty cool gig for the government. Yeah, speaking of uh, you know the game, let's talk about real estate, Tom, because that is a multi-dimensional asset. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Can you talk about how you you know you can earn money in different ways and in, in the the value of owning real estate and the tax benefits associated with it? Yeah, so uh, and, and of course that's one of the seven investments as you would yeah. expect would be real estate. And it's a very big one and what uh, one of the interesting things we did was we looked at 15 different countries and the incentives in the these seven investments in those 15 different countries and real estate Business and real estate are the two that are really highly incentivized by almost every country, okay? And you think about, well, why is that? Well, the government needs housing. And the yeah. most governments realize that they are terrible at building housing, right? They should <laughs> not be in that business, okay? Most governments know that. And so what they do is they say, well, and Ronald Reagan really was the big um, incentivizer when it came to real estate, right? 1981, the 1982, the 1984, the 1986. I mean, he 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 had so many um, incentives for real estate, and that's where they that's where the big 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 real estate incentives really started was with Ronald Reagan. Um, yeah, and and the thing about real estate is, and this is what I love in this book, if you choose any one of those investments, you're going to be doing great. But what if you can actually choose, use multiples of those investments. And real estate is the place. So here's the the cool thing about real estate. Real estate's also a business, right? I mean, basically you get all the business benefits at the same time you're getting the real estate benefits. On top of that, if you do any technology in your real estate, you get the technology benefits. On top of that, if you do energy, you get the energy benefits. And what's, I think, the biggest tax benefit and the biggest actually wealth benefit from real estate is debt. Um, this is the, the government has a huge incentive for us to use debt. And the reason is because anytime the bank lends money, that is money that's created in the economy, right? So they're actually you're actually creating money when you borrow money. And so the government, that's, you really want to expand the economy. You've got to expand the money supply and you've got to expand, and, but it's got to be used money supply. So it can't just be like the Fed, you know, lowering interest rates or the, the, the you know, floating T-bills or something. You've actually got to use the money. Well, when you're mm-hmm. going out in real estate, you're using the money to buy a hard asset, right? And if you're buying that asset, somebody's selling the asset. And on top of that, eventually somebody's building the asset. So uh, there's huge benefits for society from a housing standpoint or commercial standpoint, whatever kind of real estate, industrial, whatever you're doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, the the government just highly incentivizes that we have an incentive right now going on that I'm sure you're familiar with called bonus depreciation that um, you basically get if if you put down 20 to 30%, you're probably going to get that same amount of down payment in a deduction the very first year you own the property. And that 
starts going away after this year, right? Starts phasing out beginning in uh, 2023. So uh, this would be the year. If you ever thought about starting into getting into real estate investing, this would be the year to start. The government pays you more now than they're ever going to pay you in the future. Yeah. That's and real, and real estate is a huge hedge against inflation. You know, and I, and I was listening to your podcast, Tom, or uh, I was somewhere I saw you and you had a story, the Zimbabwe story. Um, no. Can can we talk about that and, and we kind of shift into you know the inflationary environment that we're currently in? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, I was uh, I, a number of years ago. My wife and I uh, took a trip to Zimbabwe to the um, do an eco safari, a couple of eco safaris, and uh, our guide, uh, his name was Engelbert, named after Engelbert Humperdinck, <laughs> and uh, he sport, spoke fourteen languages, college degree. And uh, was talking to us about when the Zimbabwe dollar went to zero, what, yeah. that hyperinflation. Mm -hmm. And he was telling us that he would get paid and immediately go buy a goat, a chicken, a sheep, or a cow. Because <laughs> okay. that was a hard asset. Uh, because the money he knew was going to be worth less the next day, right? But, mm -hmm. the, but the cow or the sheep or the pig would not be worth less the next day. It would be worth the same but the next day. OK, so that 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 was my introduction into hyperinflation was uh, my my uh, my uh, safari guide, um, Hump, uh, Engelbert. I love it. I love it. I love that story. Um, and, you know, in regards to tax incentives for some of the other uh, seven strategies, um, Tom, you know, what are those you said to talk about energy and then also technology? Can you kind of go wait, wait. into those? Yeah, sure. Of course, you've got, you know, business and real estate, you've got technology, technology. I mean, the reason that uh, Tesla and Amazon didn't pay taxes for a very long time, even after they used yeah. up their loss carry forwards was because of their research and development tax credits, their other tax credits. Um, so all countries incentivize technology, some much more than the US, um, frankly. Right. And um, so technology is a, a big, there's lots and lots of incentives for technology. Um, there's lots of incentives for energy. And we, we're in an interesting situation right now, whereas we have um, all types of energy are right now incentivized. So we have uh, fossil fuel energy is incentivized, which it has been for 50 years. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to fossil fuel, uh, solar energy is incentivized. Um, uh, hydro energy is, is incentivized. Um, in uh, in, in uh, Biden's bill, the one he's trying to get through still, yeah. um, they incentivize nuclear energy in that bill. Um, uh, wind energy is so all energy because there's because energy, we all know energy runs the economy, right? You cannot run an economy without energy. And mm -hmm. whether you're a fossil fuel person or a, a renewable fuel person, wherever you lie on the spectrum, the government is incentivizing all of those right now. And when you talk about real estate, you know, I, I've been. Uh, one of, one of my um, pet projects right now is getting real estate um, multifamily owners say, think about doing solar on your multifamily and be, becoming your own uh, private utility so that you can actually charge the charge your, your tenants and then you pay the utility because you that way you can take advantage of the savings from the utilities, which is really where you make your money in mm -hmm. solar energy, right? You make it from lowering your costs um, of the utility, but if you can pass the, but if you can still charge your tenants for it, then you can act, that's actually a revenue increaser at the same time, the government will pay you, will pay about two thirds of the cost of that solar, of those solar wow. panels. So it's a, it, you know, you're only putting in a third, but you're getting, <laughs> but you're getting all of your energy reduced, right? Now, is there, are there any caps on that or, or anything that, you know, investors should look out for as far as how many properties they have or how the size of the property? Uh, not really. I mean, consider that you've got a 26% tax credit. That's dollar for dollar. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you've got an 87% tax deduction. So that's, um, you know, if you're in 40% tax bracket, you know, that's another boatload of money. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which is where you get down to the government's paying really about two thirds of the cost of that, um, of that project. Um, as, as long as you're able to fully take advantage. Now you need to have good tax advisors, obviously, because not 
all tax advisors are created equal and not all um, investors are created equal, frankly, um, as we know. And so what we want to make sure we do is we want to make sure that we're getting the right amount for the investors and they're able to use it. One Now, here's an interesting thing. Now, you're you all so familiar with, with real estate. You know, we got the passive loss issue with real estate, right? If you're a passive investor, you could be limited on your losses if you don't have good tax advice. Um, that's not the case with the solar energy credit. The credit, the, the depreciation deduction would be passive, but the credit is not. There is no, there is no passive um, restriction on the credit. Hmm. Interesting. And I was listening to one of your podcasts recently um, with the real estate uh, professional, uh, John was his name? Uh, John, I forget his name. But uh, anyways, he was talking about the supply and demand currently going on in, in the market. Uh, and that I, what stood out was he said that it's like going to a grocery store and they're still being 60 to 80% of the shelves uh, right. uh, empty. Uh, can you kind of talk about that current supply and demand? Uh, in the marketplace, and you know, where do you see the, the, the real estate going here in the, in the in the next six months? Well, and 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 you know, I I do rely on experts for this, and, and yeah. every, everything I'm seeing says we're still short on supply, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So as long as you're short on supply, you know, one of the interesting things he said um, in that podcast was that uh, inflation is higher than as long as inflation is higher than interest rates, you're in a pretty good spot in real estate because your rents your rents are going up by the inflation amount, but you're paying off your debt, but your debt is not going up because your debt's at that lower interest rate. So even if even if debt's at 6%, if inflation's at eight and a half percent, you're in that really unusual position when you think mm -hmm. about it. I mean, five years ago, uh, debt was more than inflation. Inflation was 2%, debt was 4%. Now debt six percent, inflation's eight and a half percent. So we're actually in a positive cycle from the standpoint of rent growth uh, compared to uh, compared to the amount of debt, the the cost of the debt. So we think that six percent debt is expensive, but we're thinking because we're looking at last year, we're not looking at fifteen years ago, right? Fifteen sure. years ago, six percent was good. So um, it it's really more. Uh, Compared to what? You know, what's the relationship? That's what's important. Yeah. Okay. And let's shift topics a little bit here. I'm always fascinated by behavioral finance, Tom. And that's where the financial planning is going and, and what we're doing as far as coaching our clients on making behaviors and decisions to create better outcomes. You know, I'd love to get your thoughts on uh, behavioral finance and how we can, you know, coach our clients uh, to create those better outcomes. Um. Give me some examples. <laughs> well, I mean, look, we're, we're, we're in an environment where, you know, you're providing advice to clients, right? And you right. got to coach them um, to um, and make those behavior changes and, you know, make sure they're saving and investing. So, you know, that's where we're kind of moving forward as far as financial planning. It's not just a plan. It's coaching that person. Uh, I had Dr. Daniel Crosby. You probably ask yourself, what's Tally for? Well, Tally 4 is a tax flow that empowers firms to automate the tax trial balance, saving them hours per return in three easy steps. Import, adjust, and file. Import. Tally 4 accepts data from all major accounting systems. Adjust. Your accounting and tax teams can collaborate to make all the necessary tax-based adjustments. And file. Once the tax trial balance is completed and approved, Tally 4 can send it to any leading tax product. Tallyforce import, adjust, and final process will help you reduce the time it takes to create a tax return from hours to just minutes. To learn more about using Tallyfor for your CPA firm, head over to tallyfor.com. That's T A L L Y F O R.com. During the podcast, he's a New York Times bestselling author, and he talks about the three E's education, environment, encouragement. You know, education alone is not going to change uh, right. somebody. They need the correct environment and then the encouragement from the advisor, someone like yourself on guiding them right direct, right in the right direction. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's any question. You know, it's um I always say that investing is more of a personal development yeah. story than it mm -hmm. is a financial development story. Uh it it really is about okay, how am I going to think about this? How am I going to what what's my emotional intelligence behind it? Mm -hmm. You know, investing requires a lot of emotional intelligence. Yeah. We're seeing a lot of poor emotional, low emotional intelligence in the markets right now, right? Yeah. People, you know, they, yeah. 
you know, your crypto goes down. Oh, I, I, I like crypto. I'm going to pull out of crypto, right? And um, or you know, the stocks stocks dip a little bit or whatever. And um, but really having that, I think that's a really, I think those three are really good combination because you do need a team around you. I mean, it's important yeah. to have people who think um, that that you're comfortable with the way they think about, it, right? How do you think about money? So for example, um, we think about taxes very differently in my network of CPAs. We, mm -hmm. we think about net taxes as a positive incentive, okay, to do what the government wants done. Yeah. That's a very different viewpoint than uh, a lot of advisors say, well, oh, you don't want to do that because that would be risky or, you know, the IRS can come get you. Well, wait a minute, but these are government incentives. These are things the government actually wants you to do. Why would they come get me? Right. So, yeah. you know, you do want to be around those people. And that's part of your environment, of course, the people you're around as part yeah. of your environment. Um, I actually, uh, uh, years ago, I moved my family two miles, two <laughs> miles south for the sole purpose of being in a, uh, getting into a better environment where people were more comfortable having money mm -hmm. because I didn't like the discussions I was hearing in my neighborhood and at church and everything about, oh, well, you know, money's so hard and this is such a tough thing. And I'm going, I don't want to bring my kids up like that. My, I, I grew up in a, in a neighborhood where money was money. was money. It was no big deal, yeah. right? It's just, you know, everybody had money. So nobody ever, never, ever worried about money. And so we, we actually moved specifically to get into a neighborhood, into an environment where um, people uh, cared frankly, cared less about money because they had money. Tom, let me ask you on that point, how would you, you know, obviously moving into one of those neighborhoods is, is great, but if you're, say you're, you know, first generation coming into money or, or, you know, taking this seriously, right. Making your, you know, emotional environmental changes, would you have any recommendations for for folks out there who are are, are trying to uh, break the cycle, if you will, of oh, of those kind of conversations? Yeah, it's really easy. Change who you hang out with. Sure, it, it, it's it's actually that simple. Change who who you hang out with. Um, uh, the, you know those people that you surround yourself with. Yeah, I mean it's it's pretty well documented, right? That your yeah. your income is going to be the average of the six people you hang out with most. Yeah. That's I, I always say your income is going to be your net worth mm -hmm. is your network. Your network is your net worth. Absolutely. It, it's just, you, you got to hang out with people that, you know, that think, don't, you know, don't think like poor people. You, if you want to be, if you want to be rich, hang around rich people. If you want to be poor, hang around poor people. Yeah, sure. Sure. And we have similar programs, Tom, and we always talk about that mindset shift because you have that CPA and your CPA. Um, uh, then you'll have the financial advisor who has more of that future facing mindset. Can you kind of talk about the importance of maybe shifting that mindset and thinking uh, more towards the future and advising your clients, not only tax saving strategies, but how to build wealth? Yeah, for sure. I mean, th there, there's a reason we named the book, the win-win wealth strategy and not some tax name, Yeah. right? Because this is about wealth. This is about building wealth. One of the things um, I, I like to explain to people is that the more money you make, the more tax you pay, but the more wealth you build, the less tax you pay. Yeah, I like that. Because the government actually incentivizes you to build wealth. They, they don't incentivize you to make money. Those are two different things. One's income, yeah. one, one's, one's income statement, one's balance sheet from a, from a, from a, from a CPA standpoint. Yeah. They're not incentivizing the income statement. They're incentivizing the balance sheet. And because that's how, that's how the economy grows, right? The economy grows on a balance sheet, not an income statement. Mm -hmm. And so- um, I, I, I do think that you really have to um, kind of ch change that focus yeah. and look for the future. I, I tell our CPAs, we don't do year-end tax planning. That's what most CPAs do. We, do, uh, we start tax planning in January. Yeah. We, we meet with our clients on a monthly, quarterly basis at, the, at a minimum. And we're constantly looking at, okay, here's where you are, here's where you're going, this is what you need to do. And it's not just from a tax standpoint. The very first thing we look at with an, a new client is how are you building your wealth? Because how you make your money has such a big impact on how much tax you pay and how we're going to do the tax planning. Yeah. It's yeah. providing that vision of, of the future. For sure. Yeah. Go ahead, Dan. You want to say something? No, I, I think that the vision of the future is, is a great way to put it. I mean, it, you think of all the people who 
you know, looking forward is a, as stressful as anything in their life. And, and to have, you know, like you said, people around you or a team that can help you shape and, and bring things into perspective of, of what your action steps are is, is powerful. Well, and, and I always think you, you never get what you can't see. Yeah. You know, if, if you can see it. Um, so, you know, we like to start out. We like to know, you know, what's your dream? What do you, what do you want? Yeah. You know, when do you want, do you want to retire? What do you, do you want to work less? What do you, what do you want? And let's visualize that. Okay, mm -hmm. because you really do. It's not just the advisor that needs to have the vision and the forward thinking, but it's, you know, helping the client understand, wow, you mean I could have that? You mean I'm, I, I don't have to just not live under a, a bridge? I mean, you know, what, what's the possibility here? Um, and this is what I love about entrepreneurs, because yeah. it's pretty much endless possibility, right? Yeah. Entrepreneurs are yeah. like the <laughs> eternal optimists. <laughs> And, yeah. and there's always, there's always a possibility. And so yeah. I, th I think that what we can do as coaches and advisors yeah. is one of the most important things we can do is, is give people a vision of, of the future, help them visualize what's possible in the future. Yeah. Excellent. And there's an acronym for hope that I like to utilize. It's called having opportunity provides empowerment. I like it. Which gives them a vision of the future. Uh, but I always say though, it's a potent combination, Tom, to be able to have that vision for the future, but also those tax saving strategies or that, because people want the here and now. I don't want to pay Uncle Sam a dollar more than I should. So I, I always say like, that's a great strategy to do. If you could be a CPA with that uh, tax saving strategy, but also provide that vision of the future, it's a great combination. Yeah, I, I, I think it's so important. I, I just think, because here's the thing that the, the future only is realized um, with money. Yeah. I mean, let's, mm -hmm. let's, be fair. Okay. Yeah. We, we may say money doesn't matter, but the, that, that vision of the future costs money. Yeah. So um, that's why, that's why I think the CPA is so important is because the CPA is the one who's helping the client look at how much money is that? How much money is that going to be in the future? How much money do you have now? How do we bridge that gap? What, what, you know, who are the team members you need financial planners and, and uh, real estate yeah. and other people on your team? How are you going to bridge that gap between your vision of the future? And we're going to quantify it and where you are today. Yeah. I mean, that's what we do with a family office and our family office model. We'll bring in those subject matter. Absolutely. Experts. Yeah. Um, so but there's a couple other uh, ones we didn't touch on. Uh, uh, Tom, insurance, I believe, agriculture. Yeah. So, yeah. so there are two that um, the, the uh, employees can, you know, can, can actually use. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is insurance and retirement plans. And it's very interesting. In, um, uh, insurance uh, gets a bad rap, I think, sometimes. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think that uh, particularly a uh, whole life or universal life gets a bad rap. You say, oh, it's so expensive. You should, you know, you should buy term and invest the difference. I'm going, yes, <laughs> if you're really that dedicated and you can really do that, that's a great plan. Uh, most people don't, um, but you're right. Uh, you could absolutely do that. Um, insurance is a, you know, there are some terrific tax benefits. It's never taxed. Yeah. Um, you know, you don't get tax deduction going in, but you don't get tax coming out either. Um, when you have a permanent insurance like whole life or universal life, then of course that's an asset, not a expense. So you're actually building an asset. It's going to pass on to your future generations. It, it could be an asset that just allows you to spend out the assets you have now. Yeah. Right. So you don't have to worry about, okay, well, wait a minute you know, what about the mortgage on the house when I die? Okay, well, the insurance can cover that. I don't have to worry about, you know, making sure that's covered. I can, you know, it's kind of that safety net type of thing. It's really interesting though, how many great tax benefits there are from an insurance, insurance standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, and then of course, retirement, this is the one. What's interesting to me about retirement is this is the one incentive that everybody worldwide says, this is a good thing. Nobody's complaining about the rich getting too much tax benefit from pension plans, right? Right. And yet this is the only one of the seven where the government just breaks even. They, they don't make money on it. They're the, it's the only one where the government does make money. Uh, they're not losing money. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just going, you know, it's so ironic to me that the government has, you know, there's these seven segments of the economy. The government is really incentivizing heavily the, the government does really well in six of them. Yeah. And the one they don't do well in is the one that the, that the, that the uh, very um, 
the vast majority of the population would say that one's okay. The others, uh, I'm not so sure. They, they, <laughs> I, I don't know about those. You know, right. I, I think those are just good lobbyists, right? Yeah, no, right. I mean, that's, it doesn't work that way. It's, it's, it's really fascinating to me. Yeah. Well, I'm mm -hmm. glad you could mm -hmm. educate the public about this. This is great uh, stuff, Tom. Uh, let's end on this because it's your last chapter. Uh, it's how can you get the government to pay for your Ferrari? So how, how can we do that, Tom? <laughs> uh, so what's fun on that, what's fun in this, this, this was a story. It started, um, the very first time I actually told the story, uh, was with Robert Kiyosaki on stage in Santiago, Chile, and it was his Porsche. And we, we, and we showed how the government paid for his Porsche. Um, fast forward to this book. Um, I've got a, a good friend, a client of mine who's in re uh, real estate and he wanted a Ferrari. And I said, well, let's look at the numbers. Mm -hmm. And we actually figured out that his investment literally made the down payment, the, the government made the down payment and, and the government's actually paying for the Ferrari. So it's not that the government wants us to own Ferraris. It's just that the incentives are so good. Now this hit for him, it was real estate. Wouldn't have yeah. to be, but uh, we use the real estate example. And uh using real estate, using an incentive that the government really wants you to do, and then taking that incentive and applying it and just using the cash flow from it to buy your Ferrari. I mean, it, it will, it, those are real numbers, by the way, in that book, that yeah. those are real numbers uh, from a real client and it's a real Ferrari. So wow. <laughs> That's All right, well, excellent. they'll have to pick up the book if they want to get in detail. Absolutely. You want to learn how to get the government to pay for your Ferrari or your Porsche or your Tesla or whatever, yeah. other, what, or your beach house, whatever it is, uh, you, you're going to have to pick up the book. That's All right. right. Fantastic. Tom, Dan, thank you for joining me. Tom, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, what's the best way for our audience members to reach you? Or how do they get the book? Um, uh, out there. Absolutely. So the book's available everywhere books are sold, uh, Barnes and Noble, uh, Amazon, Amazon, or um, we have a website, winwinwealthstrategy.com. Welcome to get it there too. And uh, and then our, our company is wealthability is uh, wealthability.com. So happy to help any way we can. Anybody we can help, we're here to help. Awesome. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you so much, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Thank Thanks, Rory. All right. All opinions expressed by Rob Santos and Rory Henry on this website podcast interview are solely their opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Arrowroot Family Office LLC or their parent company or affiliates and may have been previously disseminated on television, radio, internet, or another medium. You should not treat any opinion expressed by anyone as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow a particular strategy, but only as an expression of their opinions. Past performance is not indicative of future results.